Good afternoon. Welcome, everyone. It is our very great pleasure to welcome you to the 39th annual Scandret Lecture. Today, we welcome Dr. Sarah Schnitker from Baylor University, who will be speaking on the topic, How Do Religiousness and Spirituality Facilitate or Hinder the Development of Virtues? After the lecture, we'll have time for Q&A. You can see the mics set up there in the aisles. And then we also hope you'll join us afterwards for a reception in the BGH lobby. Hosted in the School of Psychology, Counseling, and Family Therapy, the annual Scandret Lecture Series features an outstanding contributor to the integration of Christian faith and psychology for the enrichment of our students, faculty, and campus community. And we are very grateful to the Scandret family for their support over 39 years now for this important learning opportunity for the Wheaton community. I think it's fitting that we begin our time with a prayer for virtue. Uh, this is a prayer written by Scottish minister John Bailey from the spiritual classic, A Diary of Private Prayer. So let me pray for us. Dear Lord, let us stand today for whatever is pure and true and just and good, for the advancement of science and education and true learning, for the redemption of daily business from the blight of self-seeking, for the rights of the weak and the oppressed, for industrial cooperation and mutual help, for the conservation of the rich traditions of the past, and for the recognition of new workings of thy spirit in the minds of the people of our own time, for the hope of a yet more glorious day to come. Today, O oh Lord, let us put right before interest. Let us put others before self. Let us put the things of the spirit before the things of the body. And let us put the attainment of noble ends above the enjoyment of present pleasures. Let us put principle above reputation. And let us put thee before all else. O thou, the reflection of whose transcendent glory did once appear unbroken in the face of Jesus Christ, give us today a heart like his, a brave heart, a true heart, a tender heart, a heart with great room in it, a heart fixed on thyself for thy name's sake. Amen. Hello, I'm Ray Finney. I'm chair of the undergraduate psychology program here in the School of PCFT. Um, on behalf of the School of PCFT, I'm happy to welcome you to the annual Scandrat Lecture and to the presentation today by Dr. Sarah Schnitker of Baylor. Um, a little bit about Onus Scandrat is perhaps in order here. So Onus started his teaching career in a one-room schoolhouse in South Dakota near where he grew up. And over his career, he taught at every level from elementary through graduate school. He came to Wheaton College in 1957, and he helped start the psychology program and served as its first chair starting in 1962. Um, that undergraduate program has spawned three fully accredited graduate programs uh, in clinical psychology, counseling, mental health counseling, and in marriage and family therapy. Um, and together, those three and the undergraduate program comprise the School of Psychology, Counseling, and Family Therapy, PCFT. Um, in addition to teaching and research in the field of psychology, though, Dr. Skandret was also an avid photographer and, and a writer in that field. Um, in fact, he, after he um, retired here in 1979, he went on continuing to publish both his photographs and academic articles about photography for years, and in fact, he won the 1999 uh, Charles Keaton Memorial Award from the Photographic Society of America for his lifelong contribution in that field. Um, some of his photographs are actually hanging up on the mezzanine uh, in, in the psychology areas. Um, a number of them, I believe about 120 of them, are actually in the special collections part of the college's library here. Uh, also, um, there's a few boxes of his papers that you can 
get access to and go through and see the kinds of correspondence he did while he was here and so on. And we're very grateful that in 1981, uh, Dr. Scandrett and, and his family thereafter endowed this speaking engagement. And so every year uh, we bring forth distinguished scholars, practitioners from psychology or related fields to speak about the integration of psychology and Christian faith. Uh, other details of Ona Skendret's life are actually in your program, and you, he has a unique enough name that you can Google him, and it's not like Googling John Smith. Um, so there's, there's still out on the internet a very long obituary for him from the Chicago Tribune and other, other resources where you could read about him if you wish. Um, and now that we've done that in honor of Dr. Skandret, I'd like to invite Kristen Fort here to introduce our speaker for today. Good afternoon. It's good to see you all. Thank you for being here for this 39th annual Scandret Lecture. I am pleased and honored to introduce you to our speaker, Dr. Sarah Schnitker. Dr. Schnitker, as you can see in our program, is a professor at Baylor University. She has uh, secured more than $7 million in grant funding to enable her, empower her, and her research colleagues to do the research that they do on a wide range of topics connected to virtue development. Dr. Schnicker is also known not only for being a researcher, but also for being a professor and a mentor. My research leads me to believe that she's also won APA's Division 36 award for research in mentorship connected to religiousness and spirituality, where she takes actually uh, the process of guiding people along in the research process quite seriously, both professionally and personally. I have the honor of also saying that I was a student under Dr. Sarah Schnitker when she was at Fuller Seminary, her first year as a professor outside of grad school. I was a first year doctoral student at Fuller, and she came to teach uh, at our school for many years. I am grateful for her work and for her ministry, the ways that her work as a researcher and a scholar reminds us that integration is not just about the integration of psychology and theology for psychologists who are in the clinical field, but also for people who are trained as social and personality psychologists in a wide range of other um, of sub-disciplines within psychology. Dr. Schnitker also comes as an alum of the Christian College and University schools. So if you know of Grove City or other schools like it, she is familiar with the Christian University context on multiple levels. And she brings that perspective with her to our topic. So would you join me in welcoming Dr. Sarah Schnitker? Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm really excited to be talking with you today about this driving research question that um, I think about almost every day of my life for the last decade or two, of how religion and spirituality um, can be assets for us as we attempt to develop virtues in our communities and how they also might undermine the development of virtues and character strengths. I want to start by thanking um, many, many, many people. Uh, I am uh, committed firmly to team science approaches. All right, that we need multiple disciplines, multiple and diverse scholars to be involved in research. It is not a solitary activity. And so I actually have too many collaborators to name on one slide. So I try to sprinkle their pictures and citations with all their names throughout the presentation. Um, but acknowledging that this is a team effort and also acknowledging funders and institutions that have really supported this work um, over many, many years. So I want to start, why should we care about virtues? Why do we care if religion helps us cultivate them? Does this even matter? And especially as a community of Christians, what, what is this as an outcome? Is it just self-help? What's the deal here? Why do we care? So I want to take a step back, and I am not a theologian, <laughs> um, but I'm going to dabble for a few moments, so bear with me. Um, but I was right at Fuller Seminary working closely with theologians, William Whitney, um, Oliver Chris, Pam King, myself, Justin Barrett, um, some others as well. For several years, we 
we're really trying to put together a robust theology and psychology of thriving. Um, we had a project from the BioLogos Foundation um, to integrate evolutionary psychology and Christian theology to define human thriving. And so a definition we came up with was that thriving is a uh, state of growing toward the person God created one to be. Um, so it's a trajectory, it's never achieved. Um, but this definition is also not extremely helpful because you're like, well, who are we supposed to be, right? So it's moving towards that. Um, and what does God intend for a human and or for specific human? And I am a personality and social psychologist, and personality theory is beyond what you were probably taught in undergrad. And one of our most famous quotes in personality psychology, which sadly is not that famous, <laughs> but all the personalists know it, is by Cluckholm and Murray. And they said, every man, and we might say human today, is in some ways like all other men, like some other man, and like no other man. And I think the same is true of God's purposes in our lives, that there are a purpose we share as all human beings made in him's image, that God also gives us particular giftings that some of us share, right? Many in this room are probably clinicians or training to be clinicians. That is not my gift, right? I am good at research and organizing teams um, and that we are like some others and like not like others, but then each of us also has an individual mapping and uniqueness that's shared with no other person. And so as we think about thriving, we can think about how can all humans thrive? And I think that's a question I can more easily tackle as a researcher. So who are we intended to be corporately? What's that thing we all share? And I would highly recommend N.T. Wright's book, After You Believe. If you have not read it, it is fantastic. And he makes a fabulous case of why virtues and character development really do matter as a core Christian activity. Um, and how, especially for building the kingdom of God, that we need these fruits of the spirit. And we need God to cultivate them in us, but we also have intentional practices and communal engagement to do this. And so some evangelicals in particular view virtue development with suspicion <laughs> that this is works-based righteousness or something of that sort. I can't argue with you on that, but I say N.T. Wright will. So if you are doubting at this point, go read his book. Um, so I would claim though that God intends for us to be virtuous people, not only in earth right now, but for the kingdom of heaven. So this leads to questions as a psychologist I can start to answer of, well, how do we become virtuous? How can we support virtue formation in our students as educators, in our clients, and people who we supervise, right? What can we do with our psychological knowledge to address this fundamental human purpose? And we see that our Christian faith tradition brings us a variety of answers to this question that first and foremost, right, these virtues, the fruit of the spirit, are the fruit of the spirit, that God is doing something here, um, that this is not just our own work, this is the work of the Holy Spirit, and our relationship with God is transformative. Um, but this, I can't necessarily measure God with my empirical methods, right? God does not have to be replicable and does not follow natural law. So I acknowledge this, but this is not the thing I can really dive into, but it's there. But the things that I start to be able to answer and look at is the idea that we build virtues by engaging in practices, spiritual disciplines, spiritual activities and rhythms together in our religious community. And Hauerwas talks a lot about this. McIntyre talks about the importance of a community in defining and supporting virtues. And so we know this can be true. And then also very important to recognize that suffering <laughs> is often cited as a place where virtue can be built. It often is not. We know in the post-traumatic growth literature, it often leads to harms and 
even turns towards evil, might we say, or vice. But there's great opportunity there that we need to be able to grasp, and as psychologists in particular, um, can make use and steward that suffering. Our faith tradition, though, also provides some serious caution. So religion it provides a lot of resources and potential for cultivating virtue. Um, but in the passage where Jesus talks about the story of the Good Samaritan, right, we want to say, but who's really my neighbor? Do I have to be loving to everyone? And you see these examples of devoutly religious figures from that culture showing immense failure <laughs> to express love and kindness and hospitality. Um, so there's acknowledgement that religion sometimes goes awry and maybe is even distracting you from what you really should be doing. And so I put that out there because we need to have that framing as we start researching virtues, to be looking for the good of religion and spirituality, but also to be noticing where it undermines our potential for virtue. All right, so I'm gonna step away from my theological hat <laughs> and start to really now speak into where I have expertise. Um, virtue's important, we wanna cultivate it, we have some ideas of how religion can play into that process, but what can psychology tell us? And what can our research program help us do this better? And so for my talk today, I want to first do some theoretical work of defining virtues, giving you a model of thinking about virtues that might be a little bit different than you thought before, um, really drawing in particular on personality science resources. And then take the implications of, okay, if that's our theory, what does that mean about this process of developing virtues? What should we see? And then we're gonna actually test it, which is where I get extremely excited. We have nine studies I'm gonna talk about. Um, so we're gonna go on like Mr. Toad's Wild Ride. Um, so we're gonna be talking about them at a high level, but want to give you a flavor of how we might go about studying this question um, and using a variety of methods um, that we need to get at it from multiple directions to get a robust understanding. So let's dive in. What are virtues? How do we define this? Many of you, especially we're psychologists, a lot of us, when I say what are virtues, you're probably saying, well, joy, love, patience, gentleness, peace, compassion, right? You start listing a bunch of examples. I have been hanging out with a lot of philosophers lately and doing a lot of interdisciplinary collaboration and this is how I feel <laughs> um, when I do this. My philosopher friends are like, that's not a definition. That's examples. And you need to define it, not just give me all the varieties of virtues. And so I've been working with Tim Paul in particular at University of St. Thomas, um, along with the grad student Juliet Ratchford, to really dive into what does the philosophy say and what does our psychology say? And can we come up with the definition as we collaborate that works for both of us? And so we have the definition here that a virtue is a habit, something you do and can practice, that is dispositional and deep-seated, so it becomes the core of who you are and your identity, that is aimed at activity in accord with right motivation and reason. So why you're doing a behavior and enacting the habit matters by which people act well and by which one cannot act poorly. And these last parts are really for the philosophers. <laughs> I'm like, sure, we can put that in, um, right? But that's gonna lead to flourishing um, and not lead to moral vice. We also identified from both literature some common characteristics of virtue. So in general, this, there's some argument, but you acquire them by cultivation. There's arguments around how much what God does in imbuing virtues, but psychological level, these are cultivated. And that virtues should be situated at the mean, and I'm gonna talk about that later on. 
But with this definition as a psychologist, I'm still trying to figure out how do I think about this as a construct of a person, right? Is this an emotion? Is it a cognition? Is it a behavior? Is it a trait? And in personality science today, most theories of personality um, posit there are, there are at least three levels of understanding and measuring personality. You have personality traits which is what most people think of, right? The big five, extroversion, agreeableness, conscientiousness, openness, emotional stability or neuroticism. But you also have in our study what's called characteristic adaptation. So these are more middle level units of personality, goals, strivings, defense mechanisms, what you're actually doing, what you do versus what you have would be the contrast there. And then we also find that there's information given in people's narrative identity, the story they tell about themselves and their life and how they tell that story that can't be reduced or explained by those other levels of personality. And so when we think about virtues, how should we be thinking about them? Are they traits? Are they characteristic adaptations? Are they narrative identity? And the reading I've done with philosophers and with many psychologists of virtue, it really seems we should be placing them at this level of characteristic adaptations, that these are transactional, adaptive regulation in the environment, that there's a person in a context and it becomes more and more automatic when someone res activates towards me with anger instead of lashing back out, I practice forgiving or practicing patience, right? So this is very transactional with the environment and a habit. Of course, informed by personality traits, right? So my natural disposition to be agreeable will help me um, be more kind, but I, it's not totally dependent on that. However, virtues are not just habits. Right, and in positive psychology, which began right around 2000, we saw the study of virtues really flourish in academic psychology. But there was a problem, <laughs> and still is. A lot of times this was presented to people as an instrumental activity. Want to be happy and healthy? Practice gratitude. Want to have a good life? Be compassionate. You'll actually be happier and presented really as a self-help tool. Um, but a lot of philosophers and theologians are saying, wait, these activities are the good in themselves. And you need to be cultivating them for something bigger than the self, not just for your own well-being. This is not just a navel-gazing self-development project. And it seems that we need something else when we talk about virtue. And my colleagues and I, Pam King at Fuller, Ben Holtberg, the CEO of Search Institute now, um, we propose that virtues connect those characteristic adaptations to a narrative identity. Right? Narrative identity is really central when we look at McIntyre, other philosophers, that the community provides the narrative about what is the good and what is moral and how we care for each other. And that our life stories that each of us tell are adopted from our communities and individualized, of course, but really formed within the greater group. And we maintain that it's a particular type of narrative identity that allows for the cultivation of virtue. And that is one that is transcendent or beyond the self, that it can't just be about myself and my own happiness or my own success or my own power. There needs to be something greater than the self. And that provides the meaning or the moral compass for these characteristic adaptations and actually deploys them towards moral ends. Um, and here's where religion and spirituality become really essential because there are a variety of master narratives that are beyond the self. Right? Patriotism or nationalism, that's something beyond the self. Um, some people even talk about their commitment to their sports team. Um, Baylor won March Madness last year. Not so great this year, but last year they did fantastic. That's something beyond the self, my university. 
But there seems that religion is providing something qualitatively distinct there, that we provide cohesive um, meaning systems. It's shared not with people only in our own time and place, but for millennia, <laughs> there's a long tradition. And, so, and it involves supernatural agents and God um, that is greatly different and broadly much bigger than the self. Right, so by this theory, we are saying virtues are really a combination, a patterning of characteristic adaptations with a particular type of transcendent narrative identity that provides beyond the self purpose. My philosopher friends would also say, actually need to like state the moral identity itself and say, is it moral or not? That's really tricky as a psychologist because I don't want to start adjudicating between moral systems. So we've stopped here for our psychological research because it's very easy to adjudicate whether or not something is beyond the self. But whether your moral system or their moral system is actually moral, I'm not in that business. I'll let my philosophers do that. Right, so with this model, we would take more the characteristic adaptations, or I sometimes use the term character strengths, for these adaptive capacities that we might have, and they really become virtues when they are connected to that transcendent narrative. So being able to regulate your emotions, that's really good, right? That helps you get along in so many different domains in life. But it's really not patience until it's regulating for something beyond the self. Same thing with optimism, then it really becomes hope. Happiness, right? Having the capacity to have positive emotions becomes joy when that's rooted in something and a good beyond the self and we take joy in the Lord, right? So this is what our theory is proposing. Let me walk it through with a particular virtue to make sure this is really cohering. I know when you talk about virtues in general, that's very broad, so let's take it down to a specific one, and that's the virtue of patience, which is very special to me, um, very understudied in positive psychology. Um, I think because in our culture we don't like to wait, <laughs> and think waiting and suffering is a failure of technology instead of part of our lives and something that can provide meaning um, and growth. So the virtue of patience, Define as the propensity to be calm and regulated in the face of frustration, adversity, or suffering. And really when that is in pursuit of suffering for something beyond the self. Now with patience, we might think of it typically as just patience in traffic or waiting in line. Um, but we actually find it's relevant to a diversity of sources of frustration, whether that be interpersonal, um, long-term life hardships like a chronic illness or um, daily hassles of being in traffic or your Zoom meeting not working, I guess is more relevant in the last two years. I think it's interesting, I love the picture of, from the etymology of patience, it means to suffer and comes from Ferrer, which is like to bear a heavy burden. I think the picture of Christ Bearing the cross and suffering for our sake and for the sake of love is a beautiful example of patience that is suffering um, and choosing to do so for the sake of something bigger. So with the study of patience, we can look specifically of how it is treated in the New Testament and worked with Bill Durness at Fuller um, for some of this um, insight. And we find that there's two terms um, used for patients in the New Testament, um, which I'm going to butcher, macrothumia and hupomone. Bet someone can pronounce them in the audience. I just go for it. Um, right, and macrothumia is more of the passive experience of enduring suffering that we can talk about um, and really exemplified in God's long suffering and patience with us, continues to wait and suffer for the sake of love. But there's also a more active form of the hupomone, which is more of a strong and steadfast maintenance of position 
Um, so how we persevere in all circumstances as believers and in the face of persecution um, or hardship for the sake of our faith. And it's really interesting when you look at how the New Testament transforms patience from the stoic virtue of just my own regulated internal state to something that is really for the sake of love and for the sake of other and to very communal and something that believers have in response to experiencing God's love and patience. And so if we go back to our virtue model and think about patience, okay, how is it a characteristic adaptation? So you can think about patience as these adaptations that support a good emotion regulation, um, right? So strategies of emotion regulation, cognitive reappraisal, using that rather than suppression. We know that's really adaptive and something that can be taught and learned. Um, you might even do it sometime in therapeutic context. We could talk about the types of internal working models you have about relationships rooted out of attachment dynamics, and can we shape those and change them so that they allow you to be regulated with other people. Um, and we could go on and on about things that support emotion regulation that can be cultivated. But we need that transcendent narrative that says there's something valuable in this suffering or in this waiting um, in waiting for my spouse <laughs> or my daughter to come to something on their own terms instead of trying to push them ahead into it, um, of dealing with a lifelong chronic illness where I'm nauseous all the time, <laughs> and knowing that there is something worthwhile in that. I think only when you have that narrative and, right, the Christian scriptures provide it richly, and so do actually a lot of religious traditions um, in ways that other meaning systems do not. That can empower a different type of patience. Right, so then if we think about, okay, well, how do religion and spirituality come into play? So first of all, they do provide that narrative that provides that narrative identity that values suffering in some way. Um, but we also find that Religion provides religious meaning and meaning making for daily events. Um, and so this can kind of cultivate that identity, that big picture, who am I, meaning, um, but also provide religious reappraisals. And Crystal Park um, at UConn has done a ton of work in this area of how when people face adversity, natural disasters, all kinds of different cancer diagnosis, that they can engage in religious meaning making as they process this thing that is really difficult and it helps to regulate emotions quite effectively. So that might lead to both that greater transcendent narrative identity but also just the actual skills in the moment. And then you also see that spiritual practices, um, when you start to look at them as a psychologist, you're like, oh, that's a good old positive psych intervention right there, prayer, meditation. Fasting, right? We practice. I don't know if do people do wheat and, at Wheaton do Lent very much, right? But oh, I am not having sweets. Oh, I am waiting for something and just practicing that on a daily basis and then connecting that to something bigger can be quite effective. Right? So according to this model, what do we do to cultivate virtues as a church community, as educators, as clinicians, just for our own lives? We need to help people build those characteristic adaptations, give them tools for those habits. And then we need to help them construct a narrative identity that's beyond the self and help them connect that identity to those habits. And this model really accentuates the role that religion and spirituality can play. All right, so finally time to get to the data, all right? I'm like, this is all well and good. Um, the skeptic in me is like, well, but is this actually how human beings are? Um, will we actually see support for this? And now we're going to get into the meat of things of how we can go about testing this. So one way to test it is to ask the question, is change in religiousness and spirituality across time associated with change in virtues? That would provide evidence 
um, in very naturalistic contexts that, yes, religion and spirituality really are important for that virtue formation. And we can use longitudinal studies. I'm going to present to you today. We can also ask and use experimental methods to assess if activities that cultivate virtues, if we imbue those with sacred meaning and provide a sacred label to the activity, does that change the effectiveness of it for virtue formation? And we're going to do four studies that look at that in various ways. And then we start to get into some of the newer work that um, we see a resurgence of this in personality and social psychology, or not resurgence, but actual surge for the first time, of really trying to get at the daily dynamics. So if I prayed an hour ago, what's happening now with my virtue? Am I more likely to be patient if I prayed versus if I didn't this morning or if I did a spiritual practice? So really looking at that in the moment, processing the psychological dynamics that are happening and some methods and ways we're trying to look at this there. And then finally, I'm going to present a study talking about a person-centered approach and seeing if we actually can see different forms of virtue based on whether or not this transcendent identity component is activated. So let's get going. OK, first set of studies. Is change in religiousness and spirituality associated with change in virtues over time? And we need to do this because I can't randomly assign. I'm like, OK, you get to become a Christian today. And you get to be assigned to not cultivating your spirituality, right? We can't be doing that. So we need to look at this in real world context. And as a researcher, I seek out real world context that are active for the religious and spiritual change. So we want to find places where we're going to see some movement on these things. So maybe not studying a 40-year-old, <laughs> but a great place to look is the adolescence, right? This is the, most, the time of the most spiritual and religious change in American lives, um, probably around the world, but especially we know this to be true in our culture. Um, and we look at places like Young Life Organization, where we know that people are regularly reporting significant change in their spirituality and religiousness. And so I imagine many of you are familiar with Young Life, right? They run summer camps um, that are really phenomenal and engage adolescents. And at their summer camps, about a third of campers report a change and significant conversion or transformation. Um, and so this is a great opportunity as a researcher. We can assess people before they go to camp see where they're at, and then look at them immediately following and a year later and see how do they change in their spirituality and religiousness, and how does that correspond to changes in virtue. And so we did several years of studies with Young Life, and there are studies I wanted to talk about, right, about predicting who's actually going to have a conversion based on their attachment or their goal conflict, things like that. But I want to share with you more a broader picture of the change afterwards. And so for this study, we looked at the literature, and you see that when people have spiritual transformations and changes, they tend to be in three varieties that, and that functionally. So it provides an epistemic function that it helps people get new meaning and make meaning of their lives. You see intrapsychic effects, so psychological well-being often is enhanced with spiritual growth. And then you also see what I most care about, which is the virtue development. And we call this moral sociability. So when people have change in religiousness and spirituality, does that also lead them to be better community members? And we found some really interesting results that had some real nuance to them. So with the epistemic functioning, we did not find that reporting right at the end of the Young Life Camp is have you made a commitment. There's kind of an altar call moment, a stand up, have you committed your life to God or recommitted your life at camp this week. That didn't really predict change in meaning and purpose. Neither did the growth across the year um, in spirituality or religiousness. 
But what did predict meaning and purpose was just your actual attendance levels at weekly Young Life events. So it seems here that just showing up and hearing the weekly message about God has a purpose for your life and gives meaning is enough to do it. It doesn't even have to be internalized. Um, the attendance itself predicted this change. On the intrapsychic level, here we found it was that commitment at camp or the recommitment to God, that mountaintop, transformative, highly salient emotional experience. That predicted increases in well-being a year later. How about for our virtues and our moral sociability? Here we see sustained spiritual growth really matters. So it's not the mountaintop commitment at camp. It's not just showing up. You actually have to internalize and become more spiritual and have intrinsic religiosity be increasing to also see an increase in virtues. So this study, really fun, really interesting to see, okay, religion does promote virtue, it seems, over time, but certain aspects of it, and it really needs to be internalized. So a couple years ago, we found another interesting context. Um, how many, imagine everyone is familiar with World Vision International, one of very large philanthropic organization. Um, and for many years, they used child sponsorship model for their fundraising. Um, I think about a decade ago, they did kind of more active philanthropy where they had people training for half and full marathons to raise money for clean water initiatives in six African countries. Um, and talking to people at World Vision, it was their, I believe, most successful fundraising arm <laughs> at the time. But they were also like, our people themselves, our people who are giving, are transformed through the process of training for a marathon in this group. And something's going on here. Um, and it seems like they're really developing virtues um, in a way they aren't even in their churches. So what's happening? Um, and when you think about it, training for a marathon <laughs> requires a lot of good characteristic adaptations that are necessary for virtue. Um, Especially we looked at self-control, patience, and generosity, right? Getting up and putting on your sneakers and going for the 8, 10, 15, 20-mile run, right? That, that's self-control. It's practicing habits. You've got to regulate your emotions when you have small injuries, right? There's all kinds of good stuff that's there. But will it really lead to virtue formation or you just become a really good runner, right? That's a key question. Um, we noticed that the Team World Vision, and we were looking at adolescents and young adults here in this study as well, um, many of them you'd see really internalize the pro-social motivation or spiritual motivation that Team World Vision provided. So you can see with this quote, really the person talks about how the pain of running and training, and how it's not just for their own fitness, but how they feel this sense of connection to others who are suffering, and feel that in their own body, and making that connection, and doing something to make a difference. Um, right, This real beyond the self-purpose is becoming imbued in the activity. So we collected just under 400 adolescent and emerging adult runners with Team World Vision and tracked them across the course of their training. So when they signed up for the race, um, as they trained, immediately after their race, and then about two months after that. So we had four measurement occasions spanning about six months. And wanted to look at do change in motivations correspond to change in virtue. And so we ran bivariate latent growth curve models um, and indeed found that change in both pro-social and spiritual motivation. So I run because I want to help people who don't have access to clean water and this really motivates me versus I run to grow closer to God and to grow spiritually. As they increased in these motivations, they also increased in their patience, generosity, and self-control. 
And we saw large effect sizes in particular for that change in spiritual motivation was very tightly connected to increase in patience in particular. Um, importantly, change in fitness motivation, so wanting to do this to have a healthy body, to be in shape, be healthy, that did not correspond to change in virtue, right? And that's important, so it's not just any motivations going up, your virtue goes up. No, it's really specific to these beyond the self transcendent motivations. We also ran, in a different paper, cross-leg panel analyses, so um, a little bit different way of doing it, but trying to look at kind of predicting effects across time. And here we found that intrinsic religiousness, um, and that's really about how you internalize and want to follow your faith because of its own goods. Um, that actually predicted their fundraising behavior, right? We have something objective, non-self-report, how much money they raised. Um, even after controlling for positive emotions changing over time and group belonging to Team World Vision, and of course their socioeconomic status and access um, to money in their social networks, right? But we saw that that intrinsic religiosity was predicting how much they engaged in fundraising. So we have some other studies and we continue to collect these type of longitudinal data. Um, Dr. Davis and I are actually got a grant to do, we're doing this with college students and um, we'll be collecting data at Wheaton um, of a mixed method study of this type of thing. Um, but I'm never quite satisfied with this, just this type of research, right? I'm gonna be like, can we really isolate those causal mechanisms, right? There's a lot of third variables that could be leading to these correlations across time, and um, can we actually say, yes, it's really the religious component that's causing the virtue development? And so here, we wanna start using more classic experimental methods where we randomly assign people to conditions. And we have four examples I'm gonna show you. Um, I want to also give these to you because I think they give different kinds of religious practices and context that this might be relevant to what you actually are doing in your daily lives. So the first study with uh, Kelsey Richardson, a former PhD student at Fuller who is now a professor at Point Loma. Um, we noticed that there is a quite large literature on gratitude journaling and promoting its effects for health, well-being, generosity, pro-social behavior. Um, but for many people, the way they really practice gratitude is in prayer, right? They do prayers of thanksgiving throughout the day, um, both alone and praying before meals, all kinds of times. Um, and we wondered, well, would it matter if I'm practicing my gratitude just as a psychological journaling exercise versus actually praying those thanks to God? And so what we did is we assigned participants to one of three conditions. Um, we did just journaling condition, which is every week for four weeks, you're gonna write down what you're thankful for and then read the list aloud to yourself. So what is done in most of the research literature on gratitude. And then we had a prayer condition where you're gonna do this, write down your list, but then read the list aloud to God in as prayer. Think you know what, that might be pretty different in its effects. We also, though, wanted to include what we called the social journaling condition, um, because we want to isolate, is it really about that you're talking to God, <laughs> or is it just that you are now doing a social activity, right? I'm not just reading to myself, I believe I'm having an interaction with another being. And right, for Christians, we believe that other being is actually there. Um, but even for my colleagues who are atheists, right, it's a actual social interaction if the person believes it is. Um, so we created a social journaling condition where they wrote down their thanks and then read it aloud to a friend, romantic partner, roommate, um, so that it was actually a social activity. And what we found is, and here we actually, findings aligned with our hypotheses that those who practice gratitude as prayer um, had greater decreased negative or lower negative affect and also higher gratitude, positive affect, and hope compared to those in the just journaling condition 
and also compared to those in the social journaling condition. So that social journaling condition looked just like the just journaling condition, right? And so this really tells us that their effectiveness of prayer, there's something about the theistic elements, the connecting with the sacred, and it's not just the fact that you're sharing it with someone. All right, another study, also on prayer, but a different type, was looking at intercessory prayer. And this study was with Tyler Greenway um, and Abigail Shepard. Um, and what we looked at here, we said, we see that in a lot of our religion and pro-sociality literature, that people like to only be generous more towards their own group, right? I'm very willing to give to other Christians and express my generosity to them, but do I give to people who have a different faith? Um, in the study, those are the Muslim faith. And so we created an experimental paradigm where people were either engaged in intercessory prayer or another control activity that was not prayer but was more processing cognitively um, the negative circumstances another was in. And then we also randomly assigned that crossing with are you thinking about Muslims or Christians who are under these negative contexts. And so we had expected that those who prayed would be more generous. So we actually paid participants $20 and gave them the opportunity to donate all or some of that money um, to people who were in the situation being described in the study. Um, so we're talking about real money on the line, right? This is not just self-report. And we thought, based on most of the literature, that prayer is going to increase generosity. That is not what we found. We found the opposite, that those who prayed gave less money. Um, and it didn't matter if they were praying for Muslims or Christians, they just gave less. And you're like, oh no, that's not good. Um, and I'm like, but, but this is why people get upset when we, they say we don't want your thoughts and prayers, do something, right? I mean, you see that in the media after, I feel like every time you have a mass shooting, like enough, let's do something. Um, and I think uh, our thought of what's going on here is that there's a moral self-licensing effect, right? So that when people pray, they're, oh, I'm a good person. I don't need to give to continue to have the view that I'm a good person. Um, and there's also, we have to also acknowledge, though, that for all our participants were Christians who attended church regularly. Prayer was an action, right? This isn't... This is something they actually did contribute to the problem. And so that feeling of dissonance that might have been created for the other participants who weren't praying or just processing this horrible situation um, in Myanmar, Burma, for them, they have a sense of cognitive dissonance. If I have this information, I need to do something. And giving relieves that dissonance. Whereas for the Christians, that was relieved by the prayer. And don't feel that push to actually engage. Um, we've not, uh, we've had too many other projects come into the lab to follow up on this, but I think it would be really fascinating to see if you could slightly tweak the prayer instructions that you could prevent this from happening. And that would be extremely important information, I think, for pastors and religious leaders to have. Um, so any people looking for a dissertation, go for it. <laughs> I'll be on your committee. Um, all right, another study, and here, so these first two studies were with primarily Christian participants. Um, in this study, we wanted to move beyond people who ascribe to a faith and see, can we find this more generally among people, not necessarily using fully explicit meaning, but just spirituality more broadly. And so in this study, we looked at just meditative practice, which is extremely popular in psychology, um, as you all know. And we noticed in the literature, and this is with Emily Williams, um, a master's student, that the research on meditation for a long time has said meditation quiets the ego, it makes you less self-centered, it helps you think about things beyond yourself. Um, but in the last five years, the research on meditation has come out saying, actually, meditation might lead to more focus on the self. And we have studies that it, it 
can increase self-enhancement biases and maybe do some things that we don't want. So he said, hmm, this is a great place to go because maybe the difference between these different studies is why people are meditating. And are they viewing the meditation as for my own personal well-being or as an activity that helps me contribute and support others? And so we recruited about um, almost 900 participants online um, and randomly assigned them to one of three meditative conditions. Um, and as you can see here, that transcendent condition, we used a mantra meditation where you kind of give people phrases to repeat. And there we wanted to activate, may it be good, moral, fair, contributor, this pro-social content um, versus the enhancement condition or instrumental condition, which is all about the self and winning and being the best and performing well. And then we also had a control condition where no one, they didn't meditate at all. They just logged in across four measurement occasions um, and filled out measures. Actually, let's go back. So we expected the transcendent condition is going to be the best, right? It's going to help us build virtue. This will align with our theory so nicely. That's what you hope. And this is why experimental work is hard. We did not find that. Instead, what we found is that as long as you meditated, <laughs> whether it was self-transcendent in content or more self-enhancement focused, you increased in everything. So you showed more state self-transcendent emotions, like gratitude, compassion, um, empathy, things that were beyond the self. But you also showed more state self-enhancement. And as long as you meditated, regardless of the content, you grew in virtue from across these three weeks of doing this meditative practice. And there were no differences between the transcendent and the self-enhancement meditative conditions. It was only between meditation and the control. After we got over the disappointment of, oh, what is this? What's going on? Um, like, what do we make sense of this? And this paper is actually under review right now. So maybe some reviewer will have a brilliant insight for us. Um, how we're making sense of this is that meditation practices just activate the self. And that once you activate the self, you'll get self-enhancement. But that activation can also lead to self-transcendence and thinking about other selves beyond yourself. So it really just heightens that self-processing. So we dug in a little bit deeper, and luckily we had planned these analyses, and we wanted to see how these state self-enhancement and self-transcendent might mediate the effects of that meditation practice on the virtue development over time. And so we ran multi-group um, parallel mediation models, and if this figure stresses you out, just don't worry about it. But for those of you who nerd out with me, that's what we did. And what we basically find is that for both the transcendent and instrumental meditative conditions, you saw state self-enhancement and self-transcendent emotions mediated. They were both significant mediators and had significant indirect effects. So as people meditated, and we looked at how they reported their virtues at time one versus time four, that change was explained by some self-enhancement, so I'm viewing myself better, so we have some socially desirable responding going on. But it was also explained by I actually increased in my compassion <laughs> and my feelings of gratitude and awe and the state spirituality emotions also explain some of my increase in virtue. And actually the effect size for those self-transcendent emotions was double that of the self-enhancement. So both processes are at play, but actually it seems to be more driven by my self-transcendent positive emotions that that actually is explaining some of this virtue development and more so than just straight up enhancement. Final study, and I'm not gonna go into details because if we go down this rabbit hole, we'll get lost. Um, 
My lab colleagues and I, Ben Holtberg um, and others, we actually created a smartphone app for adolescents and had a lot of activities that we know builds motion regulation and self-control capacities. And we had different framings of those activities as being done for spiritual purposes, moral purposes, and instrumental get better at being a student and athlete type purposes. And with this, we found that that spiritual and moral framing, that predicted greater increases in patience, but it did not matter for our self-control or emotion regulation measures, which actually aligns with our theory that for that full-fledged virtue like patience, you need something beyond the self pushing you into um, that virtue activity alongside just the basic skill development. All right, so our experimental studies, a little mixed. <laughs> um, but seems to have some support for the importance of this transcendent meaning. How about in our day-to-day -day lives and what people are actually doing regularly? Um, I have two studies here to present. So the first one, um, stop for a minute and consider the patient kitty cat. Anyone have cats? I don't know, I, we grew up with cats and they were serious hunters and one time they even brought the dead mouse into my brother's room because he allowed them to cut a hole in the screen and it was disgusting. But, right, when we think about a cat as a hunter, if the cat is lazy and falls asleep, they are not patient, right? They have to stay vigilant, engaged, and exerting effort, but the effort is the waiting. If they're reckless and stick their paw in the mouse hole, they're not gonna be successful either. So, right, there's this sweet spot of patience that it does not actually mean passivity or lack of assertiveness. It's that ability to stay in the moment and wait and suffer until it's time to act. So we had this question, does patience mean passivity Really important in early work on patients to say, no, no, it's actually this middle level thing. Um, we also want to say, in the moment, and as you pursue your goals, does your meaning matter for how patient you are, right? So we are not cats, we are humans. <laughs> and our meaning system is very active in our life. And we actually have existential crises and care about meaning. Um, and and we're also not cats, right? We're not gonna call someone patient if they're an assassin for hire who's waiting to kill someone patiently, doesn't fall asleep, but sticks with it and is successful. That's not patience either. So the meaning ascribed really matters for the virtue. And so how can we show this <laughs> in day-to-day -day lives? And so what we did, and to test these questions, we looked at undergraduates, um, and assess them in their goal pursuit across the course of 10 weeks. So they listed the 10 personal goals they were working on for the quarter. And then every two weeks, we would go back and say, here's your goals you said you were working on. How patient are you on this goal this week? How much effort have you exerted? How satisfied are you with your goal pursuit? And how much meaning are you ascribing to this goal? Is it really important to you? And then we did multi-level structural equation modeling. And again, detour for the other math nerds in the room. Um, this is a really cool approach where you can, right, these are nested data. We have goals nested within persons. And so there are ways, there's shared variants that I pursue, let's say, all my goals with patients to a certain extent. But each individual goal, my goal to be a good scientist my goal to be a good mother, I might find I'm more or less patient with those particular goals, right? So we can partition the variance at the within person, at the goal level, and then at the actual person level. And that's the wild diagram. We'll put that away. If you want to talk about the nerdy parts of it, come talk to me afterwards. Um, 
And we found, indeed, that people tend to have a person level level of patience, right? So we can understand, I, if you're patient at your job, you're probably also somewhat patient with your kid and different types of goals. But what's more interesting is that there was a lot of variance carried at the goal level. And there we actually looked at those goals and how they predicted each other over those five time points with cross-leg models. And we found that meaning, patience, and effort co-facilitated each other. So if a student was patient at time one, they were more likely, they were gonna express higher effort at time two. Which might be counterintuitive to some, right? You're patient, you're actually more effort? Yes, patience is actually helping you stick with it. Um, but also and really important, if they had more meaning at a goal, at time one, at time two, they're also gonna be more patient on that goal, and vice versa. When I'm patient, I start to actually imbue more meaning. So there's this reciprocal dynamic that we can actually uncover um, with this type of analysis. Um, and we found that patience and effort predicted project satisfaction over time, but that was unidirectional. And then satisfaction inversely predicted meaning, um, which is a little counterintuitive, but I think makes a lot of sense. So actually, you become satisfied with how well you're doing on this goal. You ascribe less meaning to it. It's like once you learn to tie your shoes, it's no longer meaningful. Um, right, so does the reason for waiting matter? Yes, meaning in the moment predicts goal pursuit and it does not reflect passivity. It actually increases, patience increases effort. Right, and so this really aligns with Aristotle's kind of golden mean of virtues, where virtues have both a vice of excess and deficiency. And right, for patience, that would be too much patience is apathy, and too little patience is recklessness, what we typically think of. And I don't have time to go into it today, but this is happening right now in the lab where we actually think virtues have twins or pairings that are really essential for each other and courage shares the vices in reverse with patience. Um, and so if you have deficient courage, that's apathy and that we're showing in some of our work that these two complement each other, um, which I think with patience is really important. Um, we don't want to tell people who are being oppressed, oh, just be patient. <laughs> they also need courage to fight for justice, and it's the balance of the two that's essential. Yep, and we're actually finding it works, that model, with our data. All right, last study in this group. Data are being crunched right now. These models actually almost break our computers. They make, like, I get videos from my postdoc, Merve Balkai Inche, pictured here of her computer running these models. Um, but we wanted to look at adolescence during Ramadan fast, right? So in Ramadan, you are dry fasting, so no water or food from sunrise to sundown. And this is a really interesting context. And if we look at the daily engagement between spiritual practice, patience, gratitude, how these dynamics unfold, we looked at that during a week before Ramadan began, during Ramadan, and then a couple weeks after Ramadan ended to look at how this is almost a naturalistic intervention of practicing self-control and patience through fasting. Um, and what we find is that within actual individuals, so not mean level, but the person, each particular adolescent, that situational patience and compassion during Ramadan were higher than before or after Ramadan. So that heightened spiritual practice was leading to more patience in the moment. Um, but gratitude's even more exciting is that you see higher gratitude during Ramadan and then it actually persists even after they are not doing that practice anymore. But we didn't see these effects for just emotions, so there's something specific to these virtues. And this, there's so much more to be said, the numbers are still crunching. All right, you know, I am going to actually skip this last study. If anyone's interested in thrift, we can talk about it. 
but I want to make sure we have enough time for questions. So what do our data say, right? Let's go back to this. Is change in religiousness and spirituality associated with change in virtues? Yes, most definitely. What do our experimental studies say? They say sometimes imbuing virtue building activities with sacred meaning promotes virtues. Sometimes it undermines it. Sometimes it's really confusing, like with the meditation study, but there's a lot to be unpacked. Um, our daily life experience studies show us that meaning really does matter. Um, and then the part I skipped, we can identify kind of virtuous profiles of, that are full-fledged virtue versus a profile that is just kind of an instrumental form. So where do we go from here? And I hope, I know many of you are maybe not researchers full-time, but a lot of students are gonna have to do research projects. Maybe this can inspire you. Um, there's more to be done here than I could do in one lifetime. Um, so hope to get you thinking. Um, with our longitudinal work, we need to start specifying the particular aspects of spirituality and religion. Is it attachment to God? Is it my spiritual struggle? What parts of my religion are really corresponding to particular virtues as they change over time? So getting more specificity. Um, with the experimental work, I love to see, especially when we have these kind of negative effects of the spiritual framing, how could we do it differently? <laughs> I'm not gonna tell people stop praying. Um, we don't wanna do that, but maybe we could slightly tweak our prayer practice and, and actually promote behavioral generosity. Um, and with these kind of on the ground, there's so much to be learned about the daily dynamics. We could think even in a clinical setting, right? So thinking about supervision, like, what happened in that room? <laughs> and what happened during the room? Does that predict my virtue the next day? And how I engage clients in the next session, right? We can really get into these dynamic processes. Right, so to conclude, I hope I've convinced you that we should think about virtues with this model, that there is evidence supporting it, that when we think about virtue, we need to think about cultivating habits that undergird the virtues and helping to connect those to a transcendent narrative identity. And that our faith tradition as Christians, we have a lot of resources there. And our church communities can do this. Our classrooms can do this. Our therapy rooms can do this. Um, our sports teams can do this, right? We have lots of opportunities. And so I'm gonna ask you for questions, but I also want to end with a question for you. As you go today, how can you, oops. Oh, it didn't include it. Well, I had a question, I'll just ask it. How can you do this? What ways can you help people cultivate the characteristic adaptations that support their virtue development? And how can you help people cultivate a narrative identity and connect that to those practices in whatever context you're in, because the context really matters. But that would be my challenge to you, is to think about what's one thing you could do <laughs> um, to do that well and help build um, the kingdom of God through that endeavor. So thank you very much. All right, it looks like we have microphones for questions. Um, I'd love to hear any questions from folks. My question's um, sort of centering on maybe philosophical, a few philosophical questions, but I think they'll still be yes. psychologically interesting. And I play uh, in that sandbox <laughs> quite often, so we'll could, see how I could do. Could you show the paired, slide, the, the paired virtues slide? Ah, yes. So the first thing I thought of when I looked at it from like a philosophical perspective, what's the essentials of courage or something? Um, uh, I guess I thought a, uh, there's fear somewhere in here. Mm -hmm. And fear might actually 
activate behaviors, and therefore I wouldn't call it apathy, but I feel like fear is sort of a lack of courage, or, or, maybe, or maybe it's so bidirectional that there's courage, there's neutrality, and then there's fear sort of on the mm -hmm. anti-virtue side. Mm -hmm. But So I guess I was almost concerned about what you found. Yep. <laughs> because I'm like, well, maybe, maybe fear would cause certain behaviors to increase and, and wouldn't be, therefore, an apathy, unless you're very narrowly defining apathy is not doing this, but if they were doing that, that, that doesn't count as apathy or something. Could you talk more about Yeah, and, that, and this definitely is under, this is one of our newly developing things. Um, and it's interesting, and right, I wish Tim were here, right, courage is part of fortitude. So Aquinas actually groups it in the same category as patience um, in his work, and I think I think the first question would be, is courage only about fear? <laughs> and I think there's also a differentiation of fear, right? Courage is not the absence of fear, it's being able to regulate beyond the fear. Um, so you might feel that fear acutely. Um, but courage requires more than just a downregulation of fear, I think. It also requires an upregulation <laughs> of other emotions and other things that push you to act even in the presence of this fear. And so that's why apathy um, would be that vice of deficiency for courage, because it's not so much that fear is there, right? I think the person who's acting courageously could still have immense fear. Um, but it's that you've upregulated your social justice cause, <laughs> that you are saying, there's a moral good and something I must strive for even and have to regulate my fear enough and have to perhaps upregulate something else to push towards it. Um, and I think it's interesting, the courage literature um, that we have in psychology, where actually one of my students is doing a review right now, it is not particularly robust, right? And part of the issue is a lot of the courage literature has looked at like, well, there's moral courage, and then how is that different from physical courage, and like people who win medals of honor for jumping onto train tracks and rescuing someone. And we've even, we have a study where we're looking at patience and courage um, in interracial interactions in particular, um, thinking about these two might be really complementary strengths, and designing, we've designed an intervention for white students in college campuses of there's courage, we know that anxiety is high during interracial interactions for white students, and so the courage to still approach that interaction and then the patience to stick with it when it maybe doesn't go well um, or you mess up. So I think, I think you're right though, we'll have to work with that fear component and Patience, too, is interesting when we think about the emotional signatures. Some people think about patience um, and anger as the primary kind of emotion pushing into recklessness. But we also see others in Aquinas talking about patience and sorrow and sadness as the actual emotion that patience is pushing past. Um, and I think there are some, there's definitely philosophers who would disagree with this. <laughs> so... I'm excited to continue to um, probe this one, and, and especially with the patience work, um, patience and courage to Templeton Religion Trust has chosen those to be core, vir when it's the two of the four virtues they're really gonna be investing a lot of money in. Um, so right now, we're actually with the project creating a strategic plan <laughs> around what research, both in philosophy and psychology and theology, needs to happen around these virtues um, to actually make progress on these kind of questions and deal with this fear, like how, how are we getting these all together? Um, and even in our patients' work, right, is impatience its own discrete emotion is a question we have, or is it just these other emotions that we're dealing with? And, I'm glad I have a large team and interdisciplinary colleagues because those are not easy to answer. Other questions?
Well, I know it is late. Oh, yes, there we go. There we go. I, yeah, good question. I'll ask question. I need to be like a therapist and let the silence just uh, sit and sit. Well, um, my question is, how did you come to devote your career to study virtue? Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so I guess it's a personally directed question. Yes, definitely. Um, you know, I... I was always fascinated by these big philosophical questions of the good life, <laughs> um, but I'm very pragmatic and love math and science and data and said, yes, we can argue about this all day, but what do people actually do and what really works um, on the ground? And so my first year of college, I worked with Pete Hill, um, who's a big researcher in this area and had him for class. And, fell in love with it and said, this is the perfect solution. I can use my math and run fun models and really try to falsify, use scientific methods um, to actually say I could be wrong. Um, I really got into this. And I think I also, though, will share, especially my research on patients, um, it also has a lot of personal significance. So Right? I developed a chronic illness during grad school where cyclic vomiting syndrome, it's bad. It's as horrible as it sounds. Um, but really made this very personally meaningful of how does one do this well? And how can we still pursue goals with patients even in the face of obstacles? And I know I'm not alone, right? I have my own situation, but many, many people care about developing their virtues even though they have serious adversity in their lives. Um, and that's been a critique of the positive psychology area is, oh, virtues are just for people, like, is this even relevant if you actually have hard things? Um, and so that very much energizes me and excited, really trying to shift the field um, to consider some of these less popular, less perhaps even the more passive virtues um, that aren't really passive, but definitely are not about exerting my own will on the world and recognizing my limitations as a human being. Yes, Dr. Fort. Dr. Schnicker, thank you so much. I have loved everything you've said, even the parts I didn't understand, but I understood most of it and it was beautiful. Um, I wanted to say first, thank you. And I also wanted to make a final set of reflections thinking about the season of the semester that we're in. We are in the final stretch this last month where patience as a virtue, endurance, fortitude, all the things you've been talking about feel especially important. And I wonder if you would leave us with a word of wisdom, especially for our students, grad and undergrad, we'll take it as faculty too, for any types of practices you recommend or things you've observed in your data that are especially meaningful in uh, moments of near crises <laughs> that people might be in. Um, yes, and I'm sure in the last two years for many people too, like I've never actually gotten so much attention from the public on patients until the pandemic hit, right? We're like, oh, suddenly, ooh, we need this. I can't control my world. Um, Yes, words of wisdom would be, with patients in particular, you are a human, you have limitations. <laughs> and that is, you are a creature, you are gods, you are not God. I think a lot of patience is helping us recognize we are not God, um, and that there's real value in learning of our limitations. Um, as far as very practical, I think connecting with your purpose <laughs> and taking moments amid the flurry and the busy to say, why am I doing this? Why am I doing these exams? What is the big thing? My, my telos, my ultimate goal, and helping realize that what you're doing now is part of that, I think really helps me um, and helps me persist and not be as disturbed by the disruptions and you have so many in research, right? We got bots attacked our study last week and right, you just have all these things, but just to keep remembering what is the ultimate thing and how is God using this? Um, and then the other thing I really use a lot is, right, that cognitive reappraisal emotion regulation strategy of reflecting at the end of the day, okay, what's the thing that most frustrated me today? 
how can I think about that in a new way and use my imagination to rethink it? Can I find do benefit finding? Is there something I'm actually grateful for in that? Is there maybe some perspective taking of how did the other person maybe feel and can I empathize? And so taking time, not sometimes in the moment, but that's often too hard, <laughs> but after or at the beginning of each day um, to just reflect and start noticing um, in a very gentle manner <laughs> um, how, okay, next time that happens, I'll do this instead. Um, that can really help and, um, and even, right, there we already have rhythms, right? I, like our family, we pray for you for meals and taking that time, like there's intentionality of, I'm gonna wait till everyone's sitting. Very simple, not just good manners. Forcing my five-year-old to do that sometime, like, nope, we wait together. Um, giving yourself a little practice test, not getting your phone out while you're standing in line at the grocery store. Like, let me just practice feeling the frustration and doing it. So I always say, practice small, and you'll build up the capacity so when it's the big thing, you might be ready. <laughs> so, yes, and hang in there. It, I think Stanislaus Lex said, you have to have a lot of patience to learn to have patience. <laughs> um, I think that just, it's very true of researching the thing too. Like, oh my goodness, it takes forever. Um, but just realizing you're playing a long game um, and that this is not a sprint, this is a marathon. Um, so, well, thank you all and look forward to talking with you after.